This video was voted for by the members of my Discord server. If you want to vote on future videos and join our community, the link is in the description. So remember in my video covering Julius where I mentioned that the Osaka team didn't make a good super boss until KH3? Well, I was wrong on that. The Zodiac Phantom Aqua in 0 0.2 is actually pretty good. By no means is Zodiac Phantom Aqua top tier, but I would definitely say she is pretty high up there and that she is the most underrated super boss. She tends to be overlooked commonly in discussions nowadays, which is a real shame since I view her to be a preview of the quality super bosses that were present in KH3. I feel as if people lump her in with the other pre-KH3 Osaka team super bosses such as Mysterious Figure and Vanitas Remnant, and today I'm here to explain why I think she shouldn't be lumped in with them. Firstly, I would like to say that up to this point in the series, Zodiac Phantom Aqua is one of, if not the most fair super boss. For as much as I like some fights like the Lingering Will, they can feel unfair at times. Some examples of this are with the whip attack that he uses once you hit his revenge value, and the fact that he can use his free hit combo right at the start of the fight, which is almost impossible to avoid. On the other hand, Zodiac Phantom Aqua doesn't have many attacks that I would consider to be unfair, as there are different ways to react to each move, whether that be a punish or a dodge. It helps to keep the fight balanced in the player's favour. While Zodiac Phantom Aqua's moveset is fairly small, she makes up for it with the many mix-ups that she can do throughout the fight. A lot of her moves are just keyblade swings, but they are different with how they are utilised in the fight. An example of this is when she will slowly walk across the arena. This could either be a fake-out attack or a teleport attack, and due to the fake-out occurring later in the fight, it will catch a new player off guard. As they continue to learn the fight in their next attempts, they will realise that this fake-out can be used to their advantage as it allows for a punish, meaning that the fight can be played much more on the offence in comparison to most of the super boss fights earlier in the series, which are played on the defensive. The Keyblade Swings are also differentiated, as some are blockable attacks and some are unblockable attacks. Thankfully, from this game onwards, there are red auras around unblockable attacks to show as much, and they can be dealt with by dodging or colliding with the attack using your Keyblade, adding to the potential offensive approach to this fight. The Spellweaver DM and the Ice Attacks are great as well. While they are good for visual spectacle in an admittedly flat arena, they also incorporate a nice variation of blockable and unblockable attacks with the clones of Aqua and the Red Orbs. It also clearly marks the beginning of the second phase of the fight, and after the DM, moves involving Spellweaver can be used outside of it, which is pretty cool, as not many other fights do so in the rest of the series. And, it is one of the few times where the player needs to base their block for an attack on the boss's sound cue, which is a new concept for the series at this point. This fight focuses around the basics of combat in the command menu games, attacking, blocking and magic. While your toolkit may seem limited, which I would usually consider to be a flaw of a super boss, I quite like it here as it forces you to be creative with how to capitalise on punishing the boss as well as making you properly learn how to deal with each attack. This is especially important for critical mode where you have a very low amount of HP and MP. For example, you can jump out of your blocks to pull off two full combos and make the fight much quicker. You are able to use the spell weaver form change during this fight too, which allows for combo extensions if you use it to the fullest potential. And you can cancel the ice attacks if you lock on and use Fandaga, which can be pretty beneficial as it saves you having to deal with that move entirely. There are some smaller tweaks that are present in this fight that go a long way to make it feel polished and refined. From this game onwards, most attacks are done in front of you to prevent being hit by a move that you are not able to predict, which also solves camera issues in previous super boss fights. There are no issues where you'll get hit by something that your block should have dealt with in this fight either, and there are small sections of time once the boss hits their revenge value where you can prepare for the next move, allowing for no situations where you are unable to deal with a follow-up move. In terms of story, I like how we are fighting a manifestation of Aqua's insecurities that she has developed during her time in the Realm of Darkness. Through this, we can see the negative effects that the realm has on those that experience it for long amounts of time, and this part of her character comes full circle in KH3. I also like the metaphorical implications of the mirror that Zodiac Phantom Aqua walks out of in the intro of the fight, that portrays this fight as a duel between the physical and mental forms of a Keyblade Master. Hopefully we can see more of this side of her character as she appears during the Foretellers arc. The music for this fight is a highlight as to be expected. It is a slightly changed rendition of Aqua's theme that is faster paced and more horrific sounding than the original version. The counter melody of piano being included in the track helps to represent the two sides of Aqua battling against each other to prevail victorious over the other. My favourite part of the track is near the end, personally.
Overall, a great sounding theme. And even if it is used from earlier in 0.2, it doesn't change my opinion on it regardless. Unfortunately, there are some flaws of the fight, which is to be expected as no fight in the series is perfect. As mentioned earlier, some of the moves can feel pretty cheap. The two attacks that are the worst contenders for this are the teleporting unblockable attack and the upper slash attack. The upper slash attack is fine on its own to be honest, and it works pretty well as a mix up. However, when it is used during the ice attack, you are not really able to fully block both the blizzard balls and the unblockable at the end of the combo, causing you to get hit. For the unblockable teleporting attack, you can quickly become adjusted for the successive swings, however the initial swing can catch you off guard and become incredibly irritating when trying to go for a no hit run, I know from personal experience. Another flaw of this fight is the visuals in the environment. While the deeper meaning behind them is cool, the ghoulish effect is all that is present in the arena, and this is pretty boring and a step down from the rest of 0.2 graphically, which is a shame as the game mostly looks pretty good. At the very least, it allows the fight to run at a consistent 60fps, but it is still somewhat disappointing when compared to the rest of the game. I would like to give some personal tips for this fight, as I find my approach to it changed quite a bit when recording for this video. 1. Don't be afraid to use items in this fight if you need to. When you fight this boss, you will have done most of the content available in 0.2, so items won't have as much use now. Feel free to use them here as much as you need to. 2. Try to stick to ground combos as much as possible. Due to your slower full speed in 0.2, it's very unlikely that you can follow up on an air combo, so prioritising ground combos will allow you to deal the most damage when faced with a punish opportunity. 3. Avoid jumping or air sliding in this fight. These moves will more often than not make you a sitting duck for any moves that Zodiac Phantom Aqua can pull off. And 4. Don't spam cartwheels in this fight. Unlike some of the previous Command Deck games like Birth by Sleep, dodge rolls are not completely invincible, and they must be timed correctly to reap any benefits from them. Well, yeah, that's about all I have to say for Zodiac Phantom Aqua. Overall, she is a very good boss with a few flaws, but nothing that drags down the positives of this fight majorly. 0.2 is a pretty underrated game in and of itself, and this fight is one of my favourite parts about it, so hopefully this video showed why I think she deserves some more appreciation. What do you guys think of Zodiac Phantom Aqua? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. As usual, I will have a link to a no-hit run of the fight in the description, but yeah, that's about it. See ya!